not sure what I did wrong to have the directly, immediately after lunch slot. <laughs> but uh, that's hell for teachers and trainers is the, is the after lunch slot. <laughs> uh, I'm Andrew Sheldon. Um, maybe I'll just introduce myself a little bit to see if I'm actually qualified to talk about what I'm going to talk about. But... Um, uh, I am all sorts of things. I'm an Anglican priest, so I'm a priest of the Diocese of Toronto, and I have a parish, All Saints Kingsway uh, Church. I am also a professor at Trinity College, where I teach uh, primarily in the area of the practice of ministry, uh, leadership in congregations. But I also teach a course on the practice of ministry with children. And uh, this is something that is a newer interest for me over the last number of years. And um, I've done a lot of research. I've studied um, at the Center for the Theology of Childhood. And uh, I have the good fortune to be married to Amy Crawford. So that's probably Amy's been my primary teacher when it comes to children uh, and children in the church. Um, and as well, I, I, I am a godly play a trainer and I've had the opportunity to train people in the Godly Play Method around the world. So I've got some ideas about children in the church, and I come at them from all sorts of perspectives, not the least of which is I also had children. <laughs> and I was a child. <laughs> and, um, and, and I was a child in, a, in the church at a time when children weren't necessarily well served by the church, but somehow I survived that. The, the session that I, I want to do this afternoon is called The Sacrament That Won't Sit Still. This was originally um, a lecture that I delivered at um, the, the National Godly Play Conference in Australia um, two or three years ago. Two or three, three years ago? And, um, and it, was, it, it was well received and it was a lot of fun. So I, I thought I would come back at it. I... I do use technology and PowerPoint, and I have lots of PowerPoint things, uh, but I've decided to eschew PowerPoint today, um, mostly because of the size of the group being relatively small and the length of the session. Um, so um, I'm going to talk, and I can talk, and I can talk, and I can talk, and I can talk. So just interrupt me if you have questions or if you have comments. And I'm also going to try and be aware of the fact that there's lots of wisdom in the room around the practice of ministry with children. So, you know, I've, I'm prepared, but I'm also happy for us to engage in conversation. And, you know, I'll stop from time to time, and if you have an idea or a burning question, like, you know, there's only a few of us here, just jump in, okay? Interrupt me, that's fine. But I want to talk about the, the sacrament that won't sit still. In the Anglican tradition, um, generations of children uh, know what a sacrament is or knew what a sacrament was um, because we don't do things in quite the same way we used to do things. But, but how many of you were confirmed and in your confirmation were asked the question or was asked the question, what is a sacrament? Only a couple, three? Yeah, you've got to be a certain age. <laughs> You've got to be a certain age. Um, because it was a long time ago, and bishops don't do it anymore. But, but in the Book of Common Prayer, uh, there was the catechism. And when you were going to be confirmed, you had to learn the catechism, right? Sure. Uh, you, so, and the bishop would, fundament, would essentially test confirmation candidates and would sometimes test the confirmation candidates in a discreet session before confirmation but would also sometimes do it right at confirmation in front of the gathered congregation, would turn to you and would say, Beth, what is a sacrament? Uh -huh. And you would say, <laughs> okay, but that's not the answer in the book, is it? <laughs> Anybody remember the answer in the book? <laughs> right, but what's the, the, in the catechism, the bishop asked the question, what is a sacrament? You got it. So an outer visible sign of an inner or an inward grace, I think. Um, 
So that's what a sacrament is. A sacrament is an outward visible sign of an inner invisible grace. And I suspect that it never occurred to a single bishop that the ones who were giving the answer, the ones who were uttering those words, may be the very manifestation of what it was that they were saying. That the visible means of grace was standing right in front of the bishop. That the visible means of grace was the child. Now, Jerome Berryman, um, who some of you may know as the, the, the creator of godly play, but, but an advocate for children and an academic in so many ways that transcend godly play, uh, wrote a book a few years back called Children and the, the and the Theologians. And in that, he proposed that children be considered as means of grace. So, arguably then, as sacraments. Um, and then he went on to, to show how children are present or could be present in the traditional seven sacraments of the church. Okay, so time for another quiz. What are the seven sacraments of the church? Baptism. Communion. Communion, marriage. Ordination. Ordination. Confirmation. 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 Last rites. Yeah, unction, last rites, different. What did we miss? Hmm? Reconciliation. Is that one of the seven? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so baptism. Communion, <coughs> ordination, marriage, reconciliation, unction, last rites, and confirmation. Now, and sometimes in the Anglican Church we like to say two of the Lord, five of the church. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus actually uttered words to the effect of baptize and whenever you eat or drink this you do it in memory. But didn't have a lot to say about confirmation, for instance. Or ordination, for instance, or marriage, for instance, yeah. Is it, that, is, is it why you said that you didn't have much to say about confirmation? Is, is that the reason why in the Anglican Church we hear, we say, if you are baptized, if you are baptized, you can take communion? Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that happened in the last 30, 40 years with the liturgical renewal movement was that uh, the church began to see that there was only one initiation rite in the church, which is baptism. And that, that once you're in, you're in. And therefore, once you're in, you're worthy of receiving all of the other sacraments of the church. I don't want to get too far down that road, though. I mean, we're here to talk about children, but, but, but there has been that change, yeah. Um, and, and including, there's a lot of talk about doing away with confirmation in the church. So I don't think it'll happen soon, but there's talk about it. All that, but what I want to say is that I would like to take this concept, and that is children as formal means of grace on the one hand, and some of the precepts of classical sacramental theology on the other hand, and explore what this proposal might look like. So as, as I, I, I'm not asking you to believe that there are two or seven, or any sacraments of the church. I'm not exactly asking you to accept the precepts of sacramental theology that you may or may not know about. I'm just asking you that in the spirit of playfulness, and we've been encouraged to play today, uh, that you play along with me as we look at sacramental theology and explore this notion of children, the sacraments. And then, fundamentally, what does it mean for our practice of ministry with children? So tell me, what do you know about sacraments? What do you know about the nature of sacraments? What do you know? Do you know anything about sacramental theology? What could be called sacramental theology? No? All right. Fine. Well, let me share some of that with you. What are some of the things you've heard or... Okay. The church today, that is like kind of the typical, depending on the denomination, the typical manifestation of spiritual reality, right? Okay, now, 
I like what you just said, a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality. Okay. Right, right. Okay, so think about this now, children. A physical manifestation of a spiritual grace. Something happens when you take. This is what I want to explore. So you're, you're on to it. So let me, let me share with you, so thank you. Let me share with you some of the precepts of sacramental theology, and let's apply it to children. And then, and then um, think about, talk about what it would look like. The first is that, and here's the big word, sacraments are efficacious. Um, what that means is that sacraments are efficacious in the sense that they do not need to function in order to realize their purpose. The bread and wine are. They are in spite of the motivation, the nature of the state, the relative goodness of the receiver or the giver. Classical sac sacramental theology names that the receiver of the sacraments is fundamentally not a player. So, so the point about the sacraments being efficacious is quite simply that they are. Now, in your church, do you have a little box somewhere with a candle on it? <laughs> and, and what's inside of that? The holy, things. the holy things. What do we call it sometimes? Reserved. The reserved sacrament. So this is bread and wine that has been consecrated on the altar, right? The, the priest has done her or his thing. So it gets put in this little box, right? Now, while it's in that little box, sometimes called an ombre or a tabernacle or whatever, it is the sacrament, but nobody's had it yet. And that's, that's the point I'm making. That's one of the precepts of sacramental theology is that, that once it has been set apart, so to speak, it is. It, it, it is before it's received. It just is. Um, and although it is true, and I'll notice this, I'll note this later, that a sacrament does need to be received in order to affect that which it represents, outside of actually being affected, it still represents. So, I'm not going to go any further down the road of sacramental theology, because I'm sure by now some of your heads are hurting at the thought of all of this, except to say that, that we want to, what I want to argue is the same thing about children that they are, they are sacramental. They don't need to function in order to be a sign of God's grace. They don't need to be pandered, pandered to, pointed out, or put forward in order to be a sign and symbol of God's grace. Their very presence in the midst of the community is to put the community in proximity to their sacramental nature, which is not affected in any way by how they function. Now, does that make sense to you? So what would the implications of this be for the practice of ministry with children, children in the church? What does this mean? What does this look like? If we consider them to be sacramental in the sense of they just are, what then becomes important for our work with children? That they are present. That they're present. Mm -hmm. In God, the other community that doesn't have children, or church community that doesn't have children, You got it. That they are present. And it does imply that churches that don't have children are missing something. I'm not saying that they couldn't possibly function as churches. Of course they can. But something, something is missing. I think the other important piece there, though, that you said is that they're present. There's, there's, there's present and then there's present. You could have children on the parish roll, right? That's a form of presence. What else might we need to be thinking about when we talk about the importance of children being present. How we welcome and accept them. How we welcome and accept them. We'll talk more about that. But what else? That they want to be. Sure, that they want to be. I think that the, they've been visible to the, or that our church does this now. And I was in thinking of this context, it might not be the most healthy. Our children are dropped off in children's church instead right. of being part of the congregation in church communion. But when we do like our children's music thing or the interlude or whatever, the joy brings the older people in the congregation visible. Perhaps just the regular visibility of 
Yeah. So where is the box? <laughs> where is the box that has the bread and wine in it usually? Sure, but where is it physically? It's it's, it's it, well, it's it's in the space. In my church, it's actually not behind the altar, but it's it's over, but it's there. It's in that space, and and all too often, children do not inhabit that space. You see, they're not present, and um, and I would argue for a, a, a real focus on assuring that children are present if we want them to operate sacramentally. Now, I don't have a problem with the practice of dropping off the children. I, I don't have a problem with what I would call age-appropriate faith formation. I mean, we do that. We do that in my church, too, you know. Um, but I notice something. I notice that when the children come into church at the offertory, something changes. The dynamic changes. Their presence, actually, is important. There's also uh, some... It could. There's lots of things it becomes. Um, there's research out there right now, actually, that, that, that links church growth with the presence of children in worship. This is a big piece of congregational research. It's called the FACT Project. It's been done over a number of years. And um, part, of the research ha has, part of the research was to um, link particular uh, indicators with church growth. And one of the things they understood was that the presence of children in worship tends to be associated with churches that are growing, congregations that are growing. That may not be accidental. Secondly, sacraments are conduits to God. They're, they're icons, um, they're conduits. The, the sacraments are signs and symbols, and in a profound sense, servants of the greater mission, which is God's mission. I am an Anglican priest. I understand that I function iconically. That is that through my actions and my words, the people see and experience God. Not in them, <laughs> but through them. People, and that's, that's kind of what the priest is doing up there on a Sunday morning. Not the attention, we're not reflecting back, we're refracting out to God. Uh, in my church, right behind the high altar, there's a, a beautiful piece of linen. It's got all these different colors and everything else in it. And um, we also have a, a, I also have a chasuble that, that is the same design as this thing. And I pull that out a few times a year and wear it. And whenever I wear it, people always say the same thing. They say, that was really kind of neat. When you were up there presiding, you disappeared. <laughs> right? And, I, and my, I remember hearing that going, yeah, yeah, I disappeared. That's the point. I disappear. Uh, we're meant to disappear. Um, we're meant to show and to point people towards God. Children as sacraments, therefore, are by their nature a conduit to God's grace. There is something about the child that points to the very nature of God. God who loved children so much that God became one. And here's my, here's my aha. When I, when I thought of this, I, I, I could still remember where I was. I got one of those goosebumps all over me. Just, I thought of this. And could it be that in the incarnation, so that is in the birth of Jesus, God was not so much bending to human nature that is that humans must begin as children before they can become what they're meant to be, which is adults. Not so much that, but in the incarnation, in the birth of Jesus, God was bending towards the nature of God by showing that what God fundamentally is, is childlike. Now think about that, because I think it's profound. We tend to think, I think, we tend to think, well, Jesus had to be born as a child because that's the way humans get born. They start out as children, then they become the really important thing, which is adults. So that's the only way Jesus could do it. Well, I would say, no, not really. Um, the Greek gods weren't born as children. <laughs> they just showed up as fully formed adults. Um, if God is God, why didn't God do that? And what I'm saying is that perhaps the Incarnation is teaching us something about God. 
not teaching us something about humanity, that for humans to become adults, they have to be born as babies first, but teaching us something about God, that God understood God's very nature to be that of a child. Because isn't it funny that the God who was born as a child grew up to say, unless one becomes as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So could it be that in the incarnation, God was not submitting God's self to the in in inevitability of childhood as a precursor to the real essence of humanity, adulthood, but it could be instead that in the incarnation, God was choosing and naming childhood as the essence of what it is to be both human and divine. As such, the child is not only one or just one more recipient of God's grace, but is in service of God's grace in a way that adults cannot and never will be. Let the little children come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. So, children as means of grace that point us to the nature of God. Unless you become as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What does that look like in our ministry with children? Anything? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, we're focused on what can we teach the children. Do you know what I mean? Hallelujah. Or we focus on what we can develop in the children, right? Mm -hmm. how, can we, how can we make sure that this child grows up to still be a person of God, you know? And yet, really, why do we want them to grow up? Back to him. Because he was told that. Thank you, Gordon. I, I love your image. It turns it on its head. Because so often we think about what we need to be teaching the child, what we need to be forming in the child, so that they will become, you know, what, what is the goal and the end point, adults, right, of a certain kind, uh, rather than saying, what can we learn from the child? What does the child have to teach us? And so much of our faith formation, so much of our ministry with children in the church um, doesn't allow for their voice to be heard, doesn't allow for them to teach us. Which is the great wisdom of what Valerie was saying this morning about the importance of wondering with the children and exercising their imagination. Because of such is the kingdom of God. And I can tell you from one who has sat in a circle with children doing wondering on many occasions, they have a lot to teach us. And there's so much we can learn from them if we just allow them opportunity. So I, that, that, to me, that's, that's the application of this particular way of understanding um, sacraments. That they point, they point us to something about God. This is not to suggest that adults don't point us to anything about God. Um, of course they do. But Williams Wordsworth once, once wrote a poem called, well, what he said was the, the, the child is the father of the man. Uh, you could take that. The, the child is the parent of the adult. So, so I, I really do think that when we encounter spiritually alive, spiritually whole adults, we're probably encountering people who were, who as children were heard and were allowed and enabled to, to be sacramental. Number three, sacraments work when they are received. And I would put work in quotations, you know. So notwithstanding, for instance, the bread and the wine in the ombre, in the little box, are signs of God's grace detached from the motivation, state, or nature of the recipient. It is also the case that that for sacraments to actually effect that which they represent, they must, by definition, be received. Okay, so we know that. So at some point, you can, you can bless the water all you want, 
but it's got to kind of be splashed on you before you're baptized. You can bless the bread and wine all you want, but you know, at the end of the day, it becomes efficacious when people receive it. So they need to be, sacraments need to be received. As such, for the Christian community to experience and to know children as sacraments, they must be prepared to receive them. Receive them in the same way that they receive baptism, Eucharist, etc. So that is, I would say, that the Christian community must formalize the reception of the child in the same way they, they do the other sacraments. So what would it look like to formalize the reception of the child in your faith community, in your congregation? To be sacramental, they need to be received. What does that look like? Right. The kinds of baptism. So for them, it, and so we keep, keep having a conversation around the validity and in a church where baptismal theology is foremost, it would be interesting for me to, to play with it and say, what would it mean to ritually welcome all of us in ways that isn't just children's time on the front steps or... Um, so you're talking, so that's, that's a ritual, which baptism itself can be. It can be a ritualistic way of receiving the child formally. And we do that. Um, some other things, though, in our practice. I think mm -hmm. having things that are suspended going on. And even when they do that. Right. If they can do these things that are thought out for them, you know. Mm -hmm. Like what? to kind of communicate to the whole church body mm -hmm. and to children. Um, having high chairs around when they're having a communion meal, like things right. like that, right. that sort of tell people, I mean, your kids are here, they're taking the blood, you know, all those little things. Yeah. Even the, the, the hand of Christ, like yeah. the baptism, you know, that there's these blood Mm -hmm. One thing that we do is um, after Sunday, in our in our church, we have we we all together until the the hymn for the homily, and then the children who go out for Sunday school who come back in for communion, or because they kind of think it's it's heavy where they're at in themselves. Um, but afterwards, just as our priest is. Um, quite new to Anglican, so I don't have all the right language <laughs> to dismiss him if he's ready. Right. He'll then turn to us, and if we've got anything to share, which we actually every week do, even if it's not the children's thing, so I think that I might just let the congregation know what the children have been doing and invite the congregation into the Sunday school room to be able to see and think, and then sometimes the children have things to take out to the congregation that they can, mm -hmm. it's just a little something that they can use, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's in the way of form, like formalizing a weekly something that says the children are important and we need the children as they need us. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's there's there has to be a welcoming by everybody of the congregation. So it's 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 an ineffective sacrament if only two or three people right. get to interact mm -hmm. with this with this blessing that that is the children of, right. of our church. Um, one of the things that I, I really want to implement at Collette Transfiguration is, um, you know, enabling parents and other people to, to speak of their own faith histories and their own faith stories with their children. But I think more importantly, parents have to equip their children to tell their faith story to others. And I think it's important for every member of the church to be open to hearing a child's faith story from 
<coughs> yep. Yep. Very good points. So here's, what I, here's some things that I think I've heard you say that I would say. There must be teaching and consensus that the child is a means of grace. So I, I think that's very important, first of all, if you're going to receive the child. There has to be teaching and consensus that the child is a means of grace. There must be practices that regularly expose the larger community to the child. There must be opportunity for the larger community to dialogue with the child. Um, one, one way that this could quite simply take place, that would be perhaps not... Obviously, one of the ways it takes place is that those of you who work with children are dialoguing with the children in your church all the time. But I'm sensitive to what was just said. It needs to be an opportunity for everybody to have that experience. And so one of the ways everybody can have that experience is that you bring the children's experience upstairs, if you like, and everybody experiences church the way children experience church, which includes the opportunity to dialogue with one another. It's funny how we have one model for doing faith formation with children and another model for adults. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're doing faith for formation with children properly, <laughs> um, it would be very much, a, as you heard this morning, a dialogue model. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of godly play for me, is the wondering questions, the back and forth. So we do that with the children. Then upstairs, the sermon, somebody stands up on high and tells people what to think and what to believe. So, uh, so I would simply say this. I say what we need more of are dialogue-type sermons upstairs when children are present. There needs to be the same institutional commitment to emphasizing the centrality of the child in the Christian community as there is in emphasizing the centrality of the other sacraments. So think about it. Think about the, the space, the budget, and the priorities that are directed towards anything to do with the other sacraments. There, seems, there needs to be the same institutional buy-in. And I, 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 I regret that tonight, today I'm mostly talking to lay people. I wish your, all of your incumbents were here because this is what they need to hear. I wish your church wardens are here because this is what they need to hear. And this is what my church wardens have heard and they bought in. Um, and that is that there needs to be that same, if you're going to actually receive the children as sacraments, there's got to be the same institutional commitment in terms of resources. For instance, any congregation that will not hesitate to fully equip a sacristy with the vessels and vestments necessary to celebrate the Eucharist and baptism should not hesitate to fully equip a space for children with the highest quality of materials that characterize such a room. And I can tell you that, that in my congregation, we have invested, we've invested close to $20,000 over the last few years to children's space, plus, I don't know what you make, Lindsay, and you probably don't want to share it, but <laughs> X thousands of dollars every year for a person who works exclusively with our children. So if they don't hesitate to pay a priest, they shouldn't be hesitating to pay for a children youth worker. If they don't hesitate to have nothing but the finest stuff in the sacristy, they shouldn't hesitate to have the finest stuff in the children's space. If they don't hesitate to make sure that that, that nave and the chancel and the sanctuary are sparkling and beautiful, then there should be no hesitation. That's one of the ways that you receive children as sacraments. Still there. <laughs> And you can quote me. You can, you just, you just had a sound bite. Share this with incumbents, my fellow incumbents. Spend some money on your children's ministry. <laughs> and you can feel free to sick me on them because I will. Number four. You probably don't know we're at number four, but we are, just in case. Right. So then when the very idea that you could be working with more, it becomes daunting. I know, at least for me, it does. It's kind of, oh, when I, when, when I was told that you have a budget, I'm too scared to ask what the budget is. Just because, I don't know why, I'm not actually sure why. 
<laughs> don't be scared to ask what it is, and don't be scared to ask to double it. <laughs> of course. They yeah. came to the room for me at Transfiguration. They had a room that did was. They want a color? Yeah, <laughs> so what, what they did was I, I picked out a light blue color, they did that, and then we got chalkboard paint. And instead of making fancy murals or anything like that, we put lots of different size circles on one wall. And I use those and I, I write out people's birthdays, I put what scripture we're going to be doing in one of them, I write out what prayer we're saying for the day in another one, I write out our schedule in another one. And then I leave one for the toddlers to sit in. I'm not. It doesn't, I, it doesn't have to be fancy. No. And I, I, I think that's a discussion you might want to have with some of your colleagues. Um, because I, we don't have much time left in this session, and that's a whole different topic. And the other thing that you need to hear me saying is I'm, I'm speaking relatively. Mm -hmm. So by that, what I'm, I'm talking about is whatever they will spend on X. You know, every congregation has different budgets. Some have more resources than others. I'm just saying that when they're allocating those resources, that, 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 that you allocate generously when it comes to children's ministry as well. And I'm sure many of your colleagues can help you with the question, how do you spend money? Um, uh, I, I can certainly <laughs> help you with that too. And there, there are, there are very good resources for children out there, and because we live in the world we live in, these resources do cost money. But you know, I'm, I, what I'm saying is, don't, don't hold back. If you won't hold back over here, don't hold back over here. So if you want to have a quality, godly play space, for instance, it costs a lot of money. And I'm saying, if that's what, that, then the church should be committed to that, and not say. Because, like, I've heard people say, well, boy, it costs a lot of money to have a godly playroom. I'm like, well, yeah. It costs a lot of money to fill your sacristy with silver chalices. It costs a lot of money to have oak pews. Yeah. You know, what they're really saying is, I don't think we want to be spending that much money on children. <laughs> yeah, it's about priorities. Number four, sacraments involve ritual actions. When the various sacraments are celebrated, they're always accompanied by ritual actions. In communion, the presider in many ways imitates Jesus' actions. Took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, saying, right? Isn't it interesting that, that when I say something like, and Jesus took the bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat. Like, you're all Anglicans, and you just hear those words, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you another story in the Bible. Jesus took the child, placed the child in the midst of them, and said, unless you become as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. How did the one get to happen every Sunday in our churches, and the other didn't. Because the language and the ritual actions are the same. Right? There's one Last Supper story. There's one story of taking a child, placing the child in the midst, and offering the child. I mean, I think I know what the answer to that is. It's just sheer prejudice. <laughs> I don't want to go into that, but, 
But, but my, my friends, my point is, is that we have that ritual action. And that ritual action was actually performed by our Lord of taking the child. Accordingly, Christian communities must design and implement ritual actions that take and place the child in the midst of the community. At the least, this would include children engaged in the myriad roles that lay people assume in the church. So I'm, what I'm going to say to you is a child could do anything, just about anything, an adult could do. You probably don't want to make a child your treasurer. But <laughs> having said that, <laughs> you, you, who knows, but... Uh, <laughs> but the child can assume many of the roles that, in, that, that, that lay people can assume. Perhaps, and I do believe that, that you need to look carefully about the presence of children in, in what you might call governance initiatives. At our church, we have had a children's vestry. The children met and they discussed motions and they presented the motions to the, to the parish at large. But I would say this, at the least, this would include children's participation in the liturgy. Not merely and only as recipients of the work of the people, but children as the people who do the work of the people. The word liturgy, liturgia, means the work of the people. They are people too. There's nothing that an adult does in liturgy that a child can't do in the liturgy. I was delighted yesterday to um, have somebody send me the link of, a, of a, a young woman who's a teenager now preaching at her church. I baptized that young woman 17 years ago. And the delight that I got about seeing her preach. But that was just my personal delight. What I was also delighted by was the symbol of that. Why not? Why not? Um, in my church, I receive my communion from a child every Sunday. Almost every Sunday she is there. A number of years ago, I was going down the altar rail and I was doing what we do, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. And this girl, little girl, took, took the wafer. And she did something interesting. She, she did what we do. She broke it. So she broke her little wafer in half. And, you know, sometimes I get it right, occasionally. And I just instinctively, I went like this with my hand. And she looked at me, and I looked at her, and I went. And so she put half of the wafer in my hand. And I said, Amen, and I took it. And to this day, whenever she's in church, that's who the priest gets his sacrament from, a child. I receive it at her hands. Why not? Right? Why not? Just imagine children as intercessors, as communion ministers, as readers, as sides people, as... This is a way of ritually engaging them in, in actions. And this is... So then they are received, you see. They're received in these actions. If Christian communities are to know and experience children as means of grace, then these communities will need to learn how to take and place children into their midst. And you need to take them and place them formally through some of these, these actions. Number five, sacraments utilize words of institution. Take and eat and remember that Christ died for you. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. As with this oil, you are outwardly anointed. Send down your Holy Spirit upon your servant. I now pronounce you husband and wife, right? Um, we have the words of institution. Unless you become as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. I just want to remind you of that again. We have those words of institution. I'm moving a bit quickly now because I want to be done. Number six, sacraments are manageable. <laughs> now, this is interesting. All the sacraments of the church have been made manageable by the church. We have policies, we have procedures, we have processes attached to these sacraments which protect their apparent integrity, right? We administer the sacraments according to clear criteria as to who may both give and receive them, right? Think of them, all of them, all of them are, are managed by the church. They may be 
given by the Lord, but they're managed by the church. Um, and so Jerome Berryman wrote, part of the strangeness of thinking about children as sacraments is that we are accustomed to thinking about sacraments as being something we can control. And this may want be one of the most profound ways in which children can operate sacramentally, and that is that they can, they can be symbols and signs in our congregation that God can't be managed. That we may have managed to manage the sacraments, but the extent to which we cannot manage children may help us to remember something about our God. Perhaps the unmanageability of children tells us something about the nature of God. Perhaps the most significant way in which children are a means of encountering the divine is that they give us a glimpse of a playful God who cannot be controlled and cannot be managed. And I hunch that this is something we have lost, the wildly unpredictable, somewhat chaotic, entirely subversive nature of God. We have tamed God, we have controlled God, and we have managed God. When in fact, our texts and traditions would suggest that our God is a compelling, demanding, and unsettling God. In other words, kind of like a child. So sacraments are manageable, but children aren't always, but perhaps that's a good thing because perhaps they are profoundly means of God's grace by reminding us that God's grace is not under our management or control. On Pentecost, I have preached from The Cat in the Hat by Dr. Zeus, and I've suggested that the cat in the hat is kind of like the Holy Spirit. And the church is the fish. You know, the fish in the fishbowl. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that, right? <laughs> we can't control our God. And the children remind us of that. So, my friends, I'm sorry that this was so short. We could go on and on about, well, I could go on and on, about what this might mean for our practice of ministry with children. But I wonder if the child is telling us something of the nature of God. I wonder if the child is a sign to us of what God values most about the human condition. I wonder if we are never so much God's sign on earth as when we are like a child. I wonder if the child is really how God wants to be known. I wonder if the child as sacrament is a rebuke to the way in which we have prescribed how it is that God acts in the world. I wonder what this all means for how we minister to and with children. And finally, I wonder, my friends, if the sacrament that best enacts God's presence in the world is a sacrament that won't sit still. I think we're out of time, are we? Do we have five minutes? Oh, good. So questions, comments? Um, six. <laughs> Sacraments are manageable. Yeah. Any questions, comments? What does this mean for our practice of ministry with children? Anything? What's whirring around in your brain? I'm imagining the children as not as teachers. Yeah. Anything. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and to me, the, the, the symbol of the child doing the reading trumps the quality of the reading. For some people. For some, well, it does for me, and I'm like all over the quality of the reading. I don't think everybody should get to do a reading. I think people that read well should get to do a reading. But I'm saying that the symbol of the child trumps it. So in my last parish, a little boy did the reading once, and, and he, he, he did a reading from the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Filipinos. <laughs> <laughs> and God blessed the congregation. There was a straight face, and they, we just listened. To, but, the, but the symbol of him doing the reading was much more powerful than the fact that he kind of messed up Philippians. But. I think, though, it's, it's also good for children to see some of Pope's intelligence. 
Yes. Yes. So we train readers and intercessors, so we train the children. We train. I get a reminder this week. We're having children read, and it's a fairly regular occurrence at our place. But I had a reminder this week from a parent when I sent, can so-and-so read? I sent it to three parents, and I chose the older children. And the parent wrote back to me and said, well, so-and-so will read. But this is a simple enough reading that to the next tier of children down are ready to read it. And I thought, okay, there I'm getting, there I need to, you know, expand my, my thinking. And because she was saying, you know, two, yeah, grade two could read this particular reading. Mm -hmm. Shoot, there I am getting, I think I'm being expansive. I think I'm being inclusive and there I'm getting stuck with this. So that's this makes a lot of sense to me because at our church we're so, um, concerned about our youth ministry and and wondering how how do we how in so many churches we're losing our young people like if we've got a child today and um, it makes a lot more sense to be in training them and teaching them and including them that's right we so that they is mm. natural there's all sorts of reasons that we lose teenagers um, but, but certainly one of them needs to be that, uh, certainly one of them is that we didn't engage them as children. Mm -hmm. So when they have more choice, it does, it, it's no surprise that they, they opt out of. Mm -hmm. If they haven't spent any time in the space, if they haven't done anything in the space, then when suddenly they're expected to be in the space full time, mm -hmm. it's not their space. It's no wonder they and stay home. Years, you send them downstairs That's right. This is, this is the, the lecture, I did this in Australia two years ago, but, but last year, the title of my lecture was The Children Will Now Leave. Mm -hmm. And my point being that, although that's not to be found in any prayer books, it's to be found in service leaflets all over the church. Mm -hmm. That line, that children may now leave. And, and my argument is the whole problem we're having is that we, that has been our overarching narrative. The children may now, will now leave. Mm -hmm. And then, then we get all surprised and upset when they they leave, they leave. <laughs> you know and yet historically the church kept children in the sanctuary historically for, it did for the entire service and you know i mean if we think back to jesus's time the church was was the home most often and you know it was it was a part of their daily lives it wasn't it wasn't just something that was done on sundays it wasn't just something that was done on holidays there was, there was a ritualistic uh, living out of their entire lives where, where God was really present in their daily lives. No, the, the children may now leave is a, is a relatively recent phenomenon in the church. And there was two problems with that. Number one, they left. And then, but the other problem is that when, when they left is what we did with them, which was essentially to entertain them. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes against, you know, my first point, which is that um, children are, are, are sacraments, are efficacious. They need to be present. Um, and they need to be more than objects, you know, that we direct programming <coughs> and, and formation to. But they're subjects. They're actually active. The, the trouble with entertaining children is that, you know, that, that's the other problem. We, we assume that children are bored in church. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we believe that they're bored, it's going to be boring, you know, which is why we started entertaining them instead of just trusting them to do serious things. Mm 